All right, hello and welcome to Point of Defense Live. I'm John Crawford, back with you on a uh, really, I think it's going to be a really great broadcast. I'm going to be, uh, along with my special guest, Charles Jennings, who I'll bring in just a minute, going to be talking about his recent debate with Travis Thomas. Now, I'm not going to be uh, going through the whole debate because it was way over two hours, but I just want to point out some highlights of some serious uh, logical fallacies, contradictions, and flaws in his arguments and Charles, of course, I brought him on since it was his debate to have him come on here and comment as well. The, the debate took place a little over a week ago on Standing for Truth on Donnie's channel. And so I want to come on here and just uh, point out uh, some of his um, flaws here that we'll get into in just a second. I'll go ahead and bring uh, Charles on here. All right. Charles, welcome to Point of Defense Live, man. Hello. How are you? Doing great. How you doing? Well, last time I was on your show, a few days later, I found out I had COVID. And this time, I've stopped taking steroids for about a week. They're still in my system, though. So I won't try to be too aggressive as we go through this debate. But uh, <laughs> Okay. Anyway. That's, that's going to be quite the challenge, though, isn't it? Mm. For sure. So, yeah, but great to have you on again. I know you and I have been doing a lot of uh, videos. Uh, a lot. I've been on your show a lot, just commenting on some different debates Mm -hmm. You pulled up people that are attacking free grace, right? And uh, yeah, we, you and I were on last night. At least it was like four in the morning my time here. <laughs> so I think you're yeah, two yeah. hours ahead of me Central Time. So, uh, so we definitely were troopers, staying up late and uh, just really enjoying doing uh, the commentary <clears throat> on things on these issues. Uh, so uh, let's see here. <laughs> Let me just post a few comments. Grace Note said, love that baptism picture <laughs> on my thumbnail. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I thought that was really appropriate. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Elizabeth L says, hey, John. Hey, how are you? And she also says, hey to you, Charles. Well, hey, back. So we have some viewers. That's always good. We appreciate our viewers. And let me just say, if you've not yet subscribed to my channel, Point of Defense, please do so. Like share, uh, as you saw there coming on, pray for the ministry. And if you can, if you can donate any amount of financial contribution, whether it's $5, $10, 15 20 or more, small, medium, large, it would be greatly appreciated because it helps support this ministry. Uh, doing these streams, the, the equipment is not free. And of course, the streams are not free, having the um, all this uh, software to do it. So please, if you want to consider supporting it, Go to the PayPal link and do that. You can also go to Charles' uh, YouTube page as well. He has a YouTube channel page 
uh, the layman's seminary where he teaches people about uh, seminary that haven't had seminary training and also teaches the Greek uh, language on there as well. Charles, you want to add anything to that about your ministry before we get into uh, this uh, rebuttal and commentary on, on uh, Travis Thomas? Just that the, the mission statement is teaching Christians how to study and share their Bible with others. So regardless of whether you're, you know, preparing to be a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, or an average Christian, there's something there you can learn. I right. primarily do everything through inductive Bible study. That's the gateway into everything, to build, the building blocks from there. So, mm -hmm. And uh, so if you haven't checked out his uh, channel, do that. He has a lot of great things on there. Uh, he also does uh, many debates like myself as well, standing for truth, as I mentioned. Now, here's one recently that you did with Travis Thomas, and we're, we're going to be commenting on. But before we get into the actual clip I want to play, let me hear your response as your overall, if you had to sum up the debate, how would you sum it up and what were your thoughts on the debate overall? Well, I knew Travis would be a handful whenever I, I got into the debate with him because he's he's a, he uses screenshots, he uses video messages, he uses memes, he uses everything he can to uh, uh, discredit you or win you to your position. And so he included some of that in there, and I anticipated that. But overall, you know, he, he claims to be Church of Christ, and I don't know if all Church of Christ believe what he believes, but basically his main argument it uh, was more about the church of Judas and the church of Satan because he was looking at their fall as a basis for why he thinks he could lose his salvation. And, you know, of course it went down to acts two thirty eight, and, and then other passages, he jumped around, you know, to deal, to try to build up their stairway of salvation, which what I did, my thesis for the debate was that, this is what's so ironic. I refuted Church of Christ by showing them that they really don't believe in water baptism for salvation because I show I put it in the experiential column because positional belief came before that, you know, and John and the issue of John 316 came up and he tried to basically say that John 316 was the only passage that we were hanging on, you know. But the thing about it is is that John 316 is it's interpreted well, number one, it connects to the old Testament and number two, it's interpreted in light of the theological purpose for the book of John. So we're looking at the whole overall purpose for the book of John and not just pulling the passage out of context. And I don't think he's doing the same thing with acts two thirty eight, or tracing the transitional nature of the book of acts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up in question and answers because I met with Wilkin in a, uh, uh, Dr. Dean's pastor's thing uh, uh, that Friday, that was the day before the debate. And it was just really great how God worked everything because uh, he's just started. He, he came in there to talk about his view of repentance. And then he started talking about Church of Christ. And he had no idea, you know, anything about my debate and everything. But when he started talking about that, I stepped out of faith and I said, hey, I'm fixing a debate at Church of Christ. You know, what is your advice? And also da Daniel from C4C asked about Acts 238. So what he said was challenge him to find where where his view of salvation is in one passage. <clears throat> so the very thing that you did, John, whenever you asked him in that question thing, is the very thing <clears throat> that Dr. Wilkin, who, who had his first debate with the Church of Christ, uh, you know, before he ever started debating and stuff, uh, brought up. And so I, I thought that was just a real confirmation that we were on the right path you know, in that sense. And so God made that debate extremely easy. Travis basically deferred to another guy named something caliper. And I went to his video and I watched his first argument and the same arguments that I use against Travis with the chart, I think refute him as well. And uh, so Travis pretty much basically depicted himself as a country boy who cares more about driving people to his channel so he can uh, phone in and have conversations with them. And, and then he, he has no problem insulting the audience because he thinks that in a weird way that those that are sincere are going to contact his show. So uh, he viewed the platform for that. So I don't think he came in thinking he was going to win the debate. Uh, I think what he was going to do is he was just going to get some, did some content so that he could spin it on his channel and convince his audience, you know. But the thing is, there was a lot of reform people that had debated him before in the audience. And... Uh, 
they know what happened in that debate. They know that that his arguments didn't hold up the water. They know that he copped out to uh, to mention in that other scholar or deferred or whatever. Well, if you don't know the arguments that well, then why are you debating? Why are you depending on this other scholar just because he's interacting with a, a, a guy you debated before, you know? And maybe that guy may well you with his knowledge of Greek or him sharing his screen and stuff like that. But it doesn't stand up to close scrutiny, at least from what I've seen. So those are my thoughts initially. Yeah, exactly. And you know something else? The whole deal about him, he he made a comment about, well, th- Charles, you need to debate these other people here that uh, know the Greek. And it's like, well, we're not, hey, bring we're not talking about other people. That's a, that's a red herring. That's beside the point. You're debating – him and you're you know he's debating you who cares about what somebody else outside is debating about? yeah and that's true that's true i mean I, it's basically you know it's like he's he's trying to get his big brother you know at that point you know it's like well do you have to have a, a backup but, <laughs> but i look at it like this if he recommends me to debate the person and maybe the guy outclasses me and all that stuff and outskills me and stuff but that doesn't matter i'm the m&m of christianity that means i'll go i'll battle anybody yeah so so that, that's my approach. You know, um, I, I believe the Bible says for all the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but a mighty God to pull down the strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself above the, 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 the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So these imaginations, these false ideologies that are out there need to be dealt with. And I would like to do it in an academic setting, in a, in a peer review setting and stuff. And but, you know, and I try to have professional debates as much as possible. And uh, I do, I and I did have had some of those, but sometimes you know it, it's more like WWE than it is you know a boxing or a discipline match of athletics, you know, because there's some real characters out there, and you try to match their energy but not co- a compromise. You know, the Bible talks about answer a fool according to his folly, but then it says don't answer a fool according to his folly. So we need to be able to answer them, but at the same time not stoop to their level. Right. And so those are my thoughts about that. Okay, well, I thought the debate was great. Uh, your chart that you used with the uh, positional experience and ultimate certainly was, uh, I think, a very brilliant move on your part because all you did was basically break, you're taking that and breaking down every scripture and running it through the chart that he brought up uh, and, and going through that. Is it positional? Is it experiential? Uh, pretty much like the difference between justification, sanctification, salvation, discipleship, and the ultimate mm-hmm. deals with, of course, final salvation or ultimate sanctification. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he really understood that because he asked you in the debate, well, how'd you come up with that chart? And you had to explain to him like the three tenses of salvation. I don't think he understood that. Uh, you explained to well, him. Well, I, I guarantee you it existed be- in some form. It existed before his five steps of salvation or whatever oh, yeah. they have to Oh, yeah. Yeah. And as we're, we're going to get into this video and I'm going to point out his contradictions. He criticizes the, the uh, one commentator for using one verse, which we don't use, all use one. We can come. Sure, we can use one verse, but we don't. We have more than 100 verses to prove faith is all that is required for everlasting life. So yeah. that's not that's a, that's a no brainer. That's an easy one to do. And yet uh, and later on towards the end, he makes some comment about uh, writing a person a check if they can show him one verse from Genesis to Revelation. Well, I hope his bank account's full because he's going to have to be writing a lot of checks. But anyway, so we'll get into that. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the actual uh, video. Can you see that? Yes, I can. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave you up there so everybody can see you and me as well. And let me see here if I can get that to play. Okay, now he st- this is where I'm picking up. This is like I think maybe midway through the the uh, debate, and he pulls up this chart to, to set this clip up. I'll explain it. He pulls up this chart uh, he, where he makes some comment. He was in college and he uh, reads the chart and makes some comments about that, which to me I thought was irrelevant to the debate because uh, he ends up admitting himself that it applies to him. So I, I don't understand the logic there, but. Let's, let's listen to a little bit of that here. We can stop and comment. I changed actually my whole presentation. And I want to read this part here that when I was going uh, to college, it was a communication class. And this is something that I always remember from school. It says deletions occur too because of your beliefs. 
If you believe something to be true, you have almost infinite capacity to delete information that contradicts that belief. And that applies to me too, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's exactly what he does. You see, yeah. he criticizes other people for doing the same thing he's doing. Yeah, um, I think the reason is, and, and, I, and I, I have done this before a little bit differently, is that Travis is viewing, Travis is teaching, okay? Even though he's obnoxious and all this, he's teaching. And he's basically trying to tell the audience, look, don't dismiss all this information. We all have the tendency to do it. You know, I mentioned in my in previous debates, I had a slide that used to say, look, if I, I change my view in the middle of the debate, you know, that's fine. If, if I can't change my mind, then what? why are you listening to me? And why are we debating? Uh, you know, but the reality is, is a person really going to change their mind in a debate? Probably not. You know, maybe if they go back and re-watch re it, maybe if they evaluate the certain claims and research things out. But in the midst of defending, you know, uh, there is a tendency to leave information out. Just like whenever uh, you and I, we started talking with Merritt about evaluating y'all's debate and just by re replaying it y'all were able to see certain things that y'all were not aware of and i think that's true too that anytime we go back and replay the tape uh we can always see things we're not aware of so i i think i think travis strategies here is he's taking a teaching mode here and he's trying to re help his audience understand look we all have this tendency to delete information uh self-confirmation biasness and stuff right. so i I mean, is it, I, I mean, it's okay for a little bit, but I feel like he wasted a lot of time in his opening. You know, that, that's what I would say. Right. Right. Um, and of course I'm kind of surprised <laughs> and I'm not trying to sound insulting, but I've got to say this. He, he makes the claim on here later too. Well, I'm just an old country boy. Well, Hey, you said it, but that's no excuse not to be scholarly and academic because you're a country boy from Tennessee. Right, and, and see, you know, I mean, this is not uh, hee haw. He, this he, is supposed to be an academic, scholarly debate, and he wants it both ways because later on, through the, at the very end of the debate, he starts slipping in the bedag and some of that other stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, which to me seems to be a little bit <clears throat> it's hard to believe he actually went to college, but because he certainly doesn't demonstrate that well, at he all. He went to college and he's military trained too, from so what I, from what I see, so. Uh, you know, we got to do our best to focus on what he's saying and not right. on, you know, uh, right. ad, hom ad hominem. We don't want to slip into that. No, you know? no, I'm just pointing, I'm pointing it out like I want to point out that he, he was using that as an excuse not to be able to, to look at our side or to study more. So, yeah, yeah right. That's yeah, that's what I was saying. I wasn't trying to be like it was. Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right. It is a defense mechanism. Yeah, that's know, what I was um, pointing out. Yeah, you can definitely see the defense mechanism stuff. Um, right. Okay, let's move on here a little bit and see what else he says, and we'll stop and comment. It applies to all of us. In addition, if you believe something to be true, you will go out your whole go through your whole life searching for information that supports that belief and ignores the rest of the information. And this is um, the facts of it. This is true. I mean, as I just as we just started, these are comments you know I mean? from the viewers. They had they're not. It, look at him. Not only does he insult the audience, he violates the people's privacy from the beginning. Now, you can make the argument, well, it's a public chat, and therefore he it's fair game. But still, he, he has no problem. Uh, he took these uh, right in the moment. I mean, that's how that's how uh, um, that's how slick this guy is. He's taking screenshots in the moment of the chat so that he can use it in the debate. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's just anyway. And he'll also take videos of, of people saying things. He's done it to me several times out of context mm -hmm. to make it say what he thinks he wants me to say. Right. Uh, for example, Kelly Powers and I had a discussion on um, free grace. I don't know if you've heard of Kel Kelly Powers. Yeah, I know who he is. Perspective. And we did a show, I don't know, a few years ago, and he took clips from that and edited it and made it, made us say like pitting us against each other and taking stuff out of context. Like, for example, I said something about, well, there are verses that seem to indicate baptism does save. He stopped me right there and didn't even let me finish. I said, however, when interpreted in the proper context, they don't teach that. He didn't put that in there. 
Yeah. He just, he just went ahead and put in there, oh, you know, you see Crawford's admitting that baptism was saved. That's and, 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 and that's the thing is, man, the guy if the guy keeps doing that, he's going to lose all credibility. And then eventually people, people are going to – I think right now the reason people are debating him is so that they can rub, rub, rub his nose in his foolishness. Uh, you know, but I think there's going to come a time wherever he's just going to be ignored. People are not going to debate him because – then you're just giving him a platform, you know, right. uh, and he's just going to continue making memes and all of this. And and uh, um, it's better that him and his little audience, you know, live happily ever after. If they don't want the truth, then, you know, th then we have to respect their free will. And but sadly, he's not going away. You know, he's 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 he has tenacity and he's going to stay on and fight, you know, and make memes and make videos but I knew that whenever I signed up to debate with him, you know, that 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 was going to happen. All I can say is that when he makes videos against me, I'm going to I'm going to use that as an opportunity to be as scholarly as possible and deal with those issues. And so God can even use that for his glory because it can educate other people uh, to more uh, academic stuff. So, you know, God can use this guy's folly. Absolutely. Okay, let's go on here. But now that he's getting ready to make the comment about somebody just using one verse, and then we'll stop it and comment. Yeah, Hawk. Yeah, he he uh, actually he made a meme before the debate of quoting Hawk and then replaying the words and slowing it down, and you know, and and uh, then he used it in the debate. So, right. Okay. Many of them are. You know, they're not even open to listen. They said salvation requires faith. It's that simple. They hadn't even heard my position from the scriptures. And that well, is anybody it. that knows anything about Travis Thomas knows his position. Yeah, and the thing is, is that he took a communication class, but yet he has no problem alienating alienating his audience. Yeah, so that's he's, what he does. he's practicing antisocial behavior. Yeah, and so uh, you know he started sort of has like a martyr's complex. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do all this negative behavior so that you reject me, and then when you reject me, I validate my existence. Yeah, you know? and then making all these, you know, condescending comments and logical fallacies that doesn't help anything to his argument. No, it doesn't support his arguments. That's why I feel like you're just not going to convince people in one debate. You got to get on my YouTube channel, and it doesn't make money. All right, and this other person, he I says, I don't know what. It doesn't make money had to do with anything, but well, he prides himself because he thinks that uh, other ministries are just in it for the money and everything. But number one, a a a, a, la a, a, a labor is worthy of his hire. You yeah. know, you're yeah. either going to pay a ministry in either either in in time or in money. And what I mean by time is that okay, you're a minister, but well, you got to take time off from work. And therefore, you got to have time to study and things like that, or you pay him in money so that he doesn't he can dedicate to that particular job. So, I mean, the money issue is not a big deal. That's just a, that's just a side way to basically imply that we're in it for the money and he's not. You know, right, right. An another logical fallacy. Baptism regeneration is nonsense. I don't believe that. That's what the Catholics believe. If you continue to listen, well, it's interesting. He believes baptism is a part of salvation as a as a connect key. So he does, in a sense, believe that if you have to be baptized as part of the, uh, uh, the whole process of being saved, that, in a sense, is like baptismal regeneration. He doesn't even really know what a syndectiki is. He's, no. he's taking a figure of speech and trying to describe what is a synonymous overlap of different words in semantic domain, you know, and, and uh, my chart refuted it. My chart showed, no, it's not a syndectiki. You got... You, whether you know it or not, or whether you want to admit it or not, you don't believe in positional baptism. You believe in positional belief that is followed by experiential baptism. And all those other things you mentioned, it's all in the experiential column. Uh, so, you know. It, it, then you'll make the comment, oh, baptism is necessary for salvation. Okay. Well, then so, if, it, if it's necessary, then what happens if the person calls up and say, hey, I believe the gospel. I want to get baptized, and then you're on, and then the, uh, you're driving over there to go baptize them, and then you get hit by a car. What happens to that person? 
you know. Exactly. Or, or what if they what if they die before they get baptized? You know. Yeah. Or they get. What if they uh, on their they're on their deathbed and they want to accept Christ and believe, but yet they they're they're dying. They can't get off the and, hospital bed and get and, dipped in water. And the thing is, is that you know some of them will say, "Well, you have a baptism desire because you wanted to, you'd be accepted." Well, the problem is this: is number one, this uh, this is the real heart of the issue. And I know they're not dispensationalists, but this is the real heart of the issue. We say salvation is the same in every dispensation. If you say that water baptism is the same in every dispensation, then where is Adam being baptized and, and other people, you know, yeah. take that all the way through and follow, follow salvation that way. So that means he's teaching multiple ways of salvation, whether right. he even knows it. Yep, exactly. So him and David Preston should get along. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. Listen to people. Uh, that are not members of the Church of Christ on YouTube, you're just going to be so confused. No, no, pause right you there. don't even, you won't even. He said he does not believe in baptism or regeneration. Now, this is the key: regeneration is a positional truth, unless you're Calvinist. You know, they would say that, right. but right. it's a positional truth. So, what he just did was he granted my thesis that, uh, but he doesn't believe in baptism or regeneration. Well, if you don't believe in baptism or regeneration, the only other type of regeneration is believers' uh, uh, baptism. So that means that he's granting that that they believe in believers' baptism. So positional beliefs before goes before experiential baptism, which he admits. Yeah, he I posted on one of my shorts. He admits that on the debate. You can go back and watch it. The, the Church of Christ are just sloppy, and they want to use their stairs of salvation, not realizing that the first stair, or not the first stair, the one at their belief is. There's a hole in it. it. It's it's rickety, you know. Right, and belief always preceded baptism in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. And also another thing, they want to they they ignore they don't understand they fail to understand that Acts is a transitional book. Right, right. Dispensationally speaking, when the church began in Acts chapter two, they don't understand that if you're going to try to use the exact same events like they were back then. In other words, we would look at the, the book of Acts and see that it was more. Uh, descriptive rather than prescriptive. They look at it as prescriptive. And the problem with that is if it's exactly that way prescriptive today, they leave out the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the waiting for the Holy Spirit as a second work of grace or second blessing, subsequent. They also ignore speaking in tongues. They also ignore right. all the signs and wonders. So, yeah, I mean, if they were to be consistent, they would be charismatic. But Yeah, um, that's, what I'm, that's my whole point. But they ignore all that. Oh, they don't want to talk about that. Right. He made some reference to the baptism of the Spirit in, in the debate, but I don't think you guys. Yeah, because he to... said, I, I assume that it's baptism of the Spirit. Well, that's because, you know, in Acts 2, the promise of the Spirit was given. Later on in Acts 10 or 11, it describes that the Spirit fell on the, on, on the, the Gentiles in the same way that it fell onto them. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about we've been baptized into Christ, uh, you know, uh, and, and all of that issue. And so that that creates the expectation that whenever you see a passage, unless it mentions water, you shouldn't assume that baptism refers to water. For example, whenever in First Corinthians 10, whenever it says they were all baptized into Moses, it don't say they were all baptized into the Red Sea. It's no. saying that they identified with Moses as the leader that was going to lead them into the promised land, you know, or, <laughs> or through the uh, Red Sea. Exactly. And context, 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 context is king. Okay. know what actually the Lord's church teaches and people like this thinking that we believe in the original sin and we teach baptism regeneration just like the Catholics now look nobody Matthew, said that nobody said he was like a Catholic that I heard no but I mean if he keeps pressing me on it I definitely will say he's like a Catholic but, so, <laughs> but if you add I guess if you add the works to it the steps that it does, it's similar to that of the Catholic, yeah. Yeah, the whole you're not issue, confessing to a priest. The issue is, is I wonder, you know, because, you know, I have studied Church of Christ stuff, World Bible School and uh, New Life Behavior and some of that stuff like that over the years. But I can't remember exactly how they view justification. Do they believe, do, do they believe in justification like us, where you're declared righteous based on Christ's righteousness? Or do they believe that you're made righteous like the Catholic Church? Because if maybe what they're thinking is that, okay, yeah, well, you believe in Christ and you receive his righteousness and you're in him as long as you continue. And then you got these other uh, things that you got to do to continue in this step of righteousness. So 
that would probably be the distinction. If I were to say the difference between Church of Christ and that is if they don't hold to justification the same way the Catholic Church does, then I would have to say that that would be the only thing that's different between them, you know, in that. They just have a different right. sacramental system, a different model of sanctification. Yeah, Catholics believe just before baptism, there's a like a, a type of uh, they call it initial justification. I think when you're baptized, and before that, there's like a prerequisite type of justification, which doesn't but, make any sense. But see, even in their justification, they believe you're made righteous, not declared righteous. Right. And so you do the first step, you get a little bit of righteousness. You do the next one, you get a little bit more, and so they on. split it up. Yeah. It's like God gives you salvation in parts, which is why they do this, the seven sacraments, uh -huh. which makes no sense. So in that sense, you got, there's like seven steps mm -hmm. to salvation or grace, as they would put it. Well, well, the Church of Christ really don't have as many steps as they think, because the first ones that are mentioned, it's just about God. It's about Christ being a substitution and hearing the word, you know, so you could you could cut down their chart, but they want to make it make look more complex, you know, mm -hmm. but it's really not. Now, let's see here. This guy, Matthew Sneed, common, commented and said, you look overlook the most famous verse. I'm assuming he's talking about John 3, 16. So listen to what he says about that. OK, but he says, wrong, you overlook the most famous verse. See? We're going to look at that. That's what a lot of people do. They have their one verse. They memorize their one verse, and that's it. Next question comes in from okay, point now, of... I want you to notice right here, this is the question portion. This is my portion of the question. He's criticizing this one guy for using one verse. But then when I ask him about the one verse, notice what, notice what he does. Right. Now listen very carefully. Defense with John Crawford. And John says, question for Travis. Can you name one passage in the Bible that lists your plan of salvation with okay. the steps, believe, repent, confess, and be water baptized? Yeah, appreciate that question, John. I love you, John. Now, let me just uh, say this. For somebody that says, I love you, you can go back on his channel if it's still there. He criticized me, called me a liar because I used to use the title reverend. He tried to say that I was saying I was God. I mean, that's just yeah, the church ridiculous. Hate, the Church of Christ hate that title. And it's like, yeah. that, all that is is just a title to rec recognize clergy. It wasn't saying I was God. Talk about a straw man fallacy. And then uh, he took what I said out of context. So explain to me how that's demonstrating Christ-like love, Travis. It's not. It's not. So it says, can you name one passage? <laughs> well, I mean, through the beginning of this, remember how I played? He takes the sum of God's word. And again, you want one passage. Well, I showed a chart. See, God gave us a book. He didn't just give you one verse. I made a joke on Facebook saying, I'm going to come up with a faith only Bible. I think he froze up yeah, again. That's, that's a, a, a logical fallacy there, denying the doctrine of justification by faith, a faith only Bible. So I guess we're supposed to come up with a baptism only Bible. Uh, you know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> any comments on that you want to say? Well, I don't typically use the word faith only or faith alone. You know, I, I think that I can demonstrate everything I need to through the chart. So rather than him coming at us like it's a cliche, I'm like, well, OK, well, show me on my chart how this don't line up, you know, because, uh, you know, there are there is a passage that talks about faith only, but it's talking about it in the sense of uh, experiential justification. I think it's in James 2 or whatever. Yeah, right, right. And, and so if you interpret James 2 as experiential, and it's uh, not, uh, by, I can't remember how it works, but I'm, I'm just saying this, that I don't go that route. You know, I don't think that that um, me taking the slogan from the Reformation is going to win a debate. You know, me, me, me making a statement from that Calvin said that, yeah, we're justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. That's not going to win a debate. They, what's going to win a debate is driving people to scripture to evaluate things inductively and exegetically. And that's what the chart does. It makes you question presuppositions. It makes you evaluate things. You make better observations and consider possibilities and then narrow down the probabilities. And um, that's why he was not able to refute it. You know, right. all he yeah, was yeah. able to do was tag in uh, this caliber guy that, that has yet stepped in the ring yet. May in the future.
And it's like, well, what, what has that got to do with debating you? He's debating you. Right, right. You're not debating. That's what, if, if you want to do a different debate or somebody wants to debate you, that's beside the point. That's a red herring. He needs to stick to the debate at hand and deal with you on this particular show. Yeah. And, get, and play another clip, some other videos. It's like, what? How about you just, can you not come up with your own arguments on your own? You have to run to somebody else. You have to run another video. You have to run to, to this or to that. It's what? like, just, you know, deal with your own arguments. He's entertaining. I'll give him that. He's entertaining, you know, exactly. but, yeah, yes. but it's like you're watching a tabloid show, you know, <laughs> and that, a national choir or, or something like that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm Mr. Country Bar. <laughs> you know, yeah. He needs his own reality show. Yeah. I mean, his oh. accent, his accent was so strong. Nobody noticed mine. <laughs> no. Yeah. Mine either. I'm from the <laughs> South. But I don't think I, I don't yeah. like that. Thank the Lord, but I had some. No, uh, but I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not hating on him for his accent and stuff. No, you know? uh, my issue, my issue with him is this: is that he comes in these debates thinking that he actually has strong arguments, and he doesn't. You know, I analyzed a lot of his debates. I didn't analyze them all, but I analyzed a, a lot of them that were pertinent for the debate. And he follows pretty much the same pattern, uses the same scriptures. He doesn't. He doesn't evolve his arguments. No. In that sense. So he's not learning from the debates. No. And he's just using the same stuff. And eventually somebody's gonna call him out on that. And uh because if you're not if you're not putting forth new arguments and dealing with stuff that people have brought up in the past, then you're not moving anything forward. And so why are you even worth debating? You know? Yeah. You're 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 just taking up time. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's move on here. Let's listen to how he responds. Okay, so, you're back, um, Travis. You're back. So I, w I would show that chart again where you see the conversion oh, account. That's right, and good. I think Acts chapter I 2. I talked about this in debate, but this is my point. The people that received the Gospel of John, yeah, they had a lot of scripture before then, but you know. Uh, but when they received the Gospel of John, they didn't just receive John 3.16. They received the whole book. And so John 3.16 is to be interpreted in light of the whole book. He's trying to make it sound like we're taking John 3.16, isolating it from that book and proof texting. If the theological purpose for the book of John is for evangelism, then we're using it properly, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the other books that he's using are, are related to sanctification issues, you know? And so he's using those improperly. So he's not recognizing the intent of scripture, uh, uh, what's going on there. So I think that's his main problem with the whole one verse argument. Right. It shows uh, that they and did believe, again, as Charles would agree. The other thing is this, is that what Jesus said in John 3, uh, to, in John 3, 16, if, if the narrator is reflecting what he said, that historically happened before Acts 2, 38. So when he's trying to argue Acts 2.38 before everything, he's going from this standpoint. Oh, well, this is the beginning of the church and then everything forward. But wait a minute. The, the Gospels talk about times underneath the Mosaic Law when Jesus was offering the kingdom. So those are historically, chronologically prior. The events and sayings are chronologically prior to Acts 2.38. Right. So that, that's, another, that's another problem that he's running into. Right. Well, what, what he does right here, um, Charles is he actually shoots himself in the foot because he actually uses he so I set him up but it's a trick question. Right, right. He's criticizing this one person for using one verse or even us. Mm -hmm. Which we don't. But anyway, but if if we if we did use John 3:16, sure. Okay. Well, like you said that that can support the thing with the entire book. As John 20 does. Was it John 20, 21, I believe. These things have been written since you may believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and believe in him you have life in his name. But he, he's doing the same thing. He's contradicting himself. He's using Acts 2. He answered the question partially, I guess you could say. He started, or tried to answer the question. He's using Acts 2 and doing the same thing, which, by the way, it does not say, uh, it does not mention all four of those steps. Right, yeah. It doesn't mention so it's still, it was still faithful. A, yeah. a good answer. Yeah. They were told to repent by implication. So you actually have to apply implication. All right, Matthew 10, 32, um, 
Romans 10, 9 and 10, we know, even though it's not stated, I mean, do you not have, I mean, are you not going to be honest about this, John? It doesn't even say Saul believed. Did he believe? Well, yeah, you, you, you like to use implication with your Where am I theology. using the implications? He didn't, that's a, that's a begging the question. Where, well, yeah, he's, implying, implications? he's implying that there's confession in Acts 2.38. Doesn't say that. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could stretch to what shall we do to be an ex because it's a verbal expression of service, but still, once again, it's not for salvation. Once they said, "What shall we do?" They're not. They're, they've already believed. They've already been convicted of the message. You're already in the sanctification issue. And, and if you point. interpret the word "because of," ace there is there is some resultant sense because they've already repented. They've already believed they're being baptized. Yeah, he he expected he expected uh, me to go that route with, in the Greek and stuff and try to refute that. And he had Wallace's grammar and he had some other stuff about that and everything. You know, if he wanted to debate Acts 238, wanted to do an ex, you know, an exegetical debate on Acts 238, that's fine. And uh, if I come across stuff in the Greek grammar and it says this argument doesn't necessarily follow, then you know what? I'm not going to use that argument. Uh, but still, it's not. it doesn't come down to the Greek in that passage. It comes right. down to the fact that they were already believers. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. And exactly. And also what they're repenting of was for killing Jesus or putting him on the cross. Yeah, they're guilty. Uh, that was a national sin of Israel. Yeah, they're guilty of a sin that's different from what we were guilty of. So that know? can't even apply to, to us today in the sense of. Yeah, yeah. They literally physically did it. So, okay, let's move right, on. Right, because their whole prop is, and they didn't, we don't have to be baptized to receive the Spirit. Mm -mm. You know? Oh, and let me mention this. He said something else in there about talking about the baptism of the Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit the same way? Well, we don't have, we didn't have anybody lay hands on us. No, we didn't he, he have to wait be. for the Holy Spirit. We received one body, yeah. one Lord, one baptism. One his, Lord, our, his, Lord. his arguments would have worked if I was charismatic, but I'm not charismatic. I'm a, I'm a selective cessationist. Yeah. So his whole arguments about that, that's why I said in the debate, look, and we have the same spirit, but we don't have the same ministries. Uh, we don't have the same gifts, you know? Right. And, and there's a difference between the sign gifts the yeah. apostolic gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healings, raising the dead, all that yeah. ceased. But the the other service gifts, faith, well, see, know, he, he stuff like that still exists. He's written a script over the years that he's used in ministry or debates or whatever, and that's fine if he goes by that script. But he needs to adjust the script according to who he's debating. Uh, hey, Cram. Um, so yeah, it, it's just it, it's just the it's just sad. You know, and I hope eventually he comes out of this false teaching. But as long as he has a platform and people keep calling in and they think that he's a top dog or something because of the, the, the things that he does, he's just going to continue to deceive people because he himself was deceived. That's why I wanted him to examine the Church of Christ doctrine and find out, look, y'all really don't believe baptism saves. You just think it does because you're sloppy Bible students, you know. Well, they'll tell you that they'll tell you it's a part of salvation. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you listen to him, this is basically what uh, Travis does. He says, you believe in Christ, the way you get into Christ. And then when you're in Christ, you're covered by his blood and the blood is applied through water baptism. So really what he's saying is if you're not water baptized, the blood of Christ is not applied to you. So really they have a, a, a form of limited atonement that is limited to only those that are water baptized. Yeah. And but yeah, which is not much different than the Calvinists in that aspect, whereas Calvinists say they were predestined, then Church of Christ says, Oh, you're gonna be baptized. And, and it's a little shocking though, because if you think about it, they're not saying belief in Christ is what saves you. It, I'm talking about what they're saying. I'm not saying how pen maps that on the chart. Because they're saying the blood is only applied if you water baptize. That's a sacramental view of salvation. To imply that the water has some kind of supernatural saving power. I mean, you could be dipped in every lake, river, pond, bathtub, swimming pool, uh, mikvah, like they did the Old Testament, whatever. And yeah. there's not enough water in hell to put out, or enough water to put out the flames of hell. Yeah. So I don't see how they can escape. I don't see how they can escape the charge that they believe in multiple ways of salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you bring up, now he debated mass. Did, circum did circumcision apply the blood? 
you know, of yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And you got those in Galatians, of course, that were believing you had to have that for salvation, which is not much different than what they're doing with baptism. Okay, let's move on here. But not with the Bible. And so, I mean, I, you could use Acts 2.38. That would be my answer for you. I just so Thank you, Travis. He just contradicted himself. Criticizing one person for using John 3.16 and turns right around and uses Acts chapter 2. Same yeah, he, thing. Same he's thing. Gonna, he's going to try using the, the conversion of Saul here because that's what that Gallagher guy did. I played this video and got extremely bored. You know, he tried to point out, if I remember right, he tried to point out that because Saul was grieving for three days because he didn't want to, uh, whatever, because the other Jesus appeared or whatever before his eyes and all that. Mm -hmm. He basically tried to say that, well, he wasn't saved yet. It wasn't until his sins were washed away and all of that stuff. It's like, no, if, if Jesus appears to you and he tells you, I'm Jesus who you've been persecuting and you've had three days to pray, to grieve or however you want to say it. I think it was three days. I can't remember. Um, you're already in the area of sanctification because you already know who you who you believe in. Paul was Saul was looking for the Messiah his whole life, and he realized that he was persecuting the Messiah. So as soon as he realized that, he didn't stop believing in the Messiah. No, he believed in the right Messiah, and and uh, recognized who Christ was. And so now he's in the realm of sanctification. So all the washing. All the other things that it has of it that that's in the experiential category. It's not positional. Yeah, but for some reason he cannot understand that a truth, b truth. Yeah, and of course now let me explain what that means. You know, Doctor Bing's got that in his book. One of his books I've got on grace uh, and discipleship. He talks about hard, difficult passages, and uh, he talks about a truth and b truth. A truth basically is dealing with salvation. B truth is dealing with uh, discipleship or sanctification, and they're different. You can go through the whole Bible and apply a truth and b truth. Right. They're not now, the same thing. So they can't contradict one another. Right. And so underneath a truth, um, I even do this in my chart, you know, underneath position, which would be a truth, you have two categories. You have those that are in Adam and those that are in Christ, you know, for the church age. So when you're dealing with a truth arguments, like, for example, if we we're doing, and when I debated Crimson on Second Peter chapter two, a truth argument is that those people were false teachers. They were never saved. B truth argument is that the first group were false teachers that ensnared the, the, uh, the believers that are in, at the end, that the latter end is worse than the beginning. So the thing about it is, is, is that you have two options when you come to a truth. Is it talking about the professors? Uh, rather than possessors, you know, this is typically how the Calvinist reads most of those passages, whereas free grace only makes that argument based on context and what they see in scripture. The Calvinist, that's their, that's their blanket category for evaluating everything. So I think that's the distinction uh, to understand is that a truth does not necessarily mean positional salvation. It could be rather uh, uh, they're not positionally saved. Um, so I just want to mention that. Okay, uh, just responding to Cram here. Okay, he asked me a question, uh, not related to this, but anyway. Um, okay, let's move on here and we'll make some more commentary as um, he goes on here. For that, John Crawford, thanks for the question. Charles, over to you. Now, now well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this through because I think he gave a, a really good, robust explanation of Acts 2. So I'm going to let this play through. I think that that was really, really good. He's using Acts 2.38 as his one passage. Yep. So, so you pointed that out. That. He's doing the same thing again, ladies and gentlemen. You see a, a contradiction, criticizing somebody for doing the same thing that he did. Yeah, he's it's just one mixing. book. He used the book of Acts, one book for all their doctrine, and they they use their one verse too, but just what the same thing they're accusing us, us of doing. So Yeah, you know, he's dismissing... Uh, our position as theology. Well, the thing is, is that his view is closer to systematic theology, which doesn't trace things through time, rather focuses on the here and now and proof texts a lot of passages together. Whereas our approach is inductive, exegetical, biblical theology. And, and uh, so 
what I would argue is that that is superior to systematic theology in this in in this context, you know, for st- understanding the Bible. And that's the whole thing is that he doesn't understand that there's part like I, I mentioned this in the debate. If you go by his approach, you would have to jump around the different passages, like Romans ten nine. Well, the thing is, is how long was it between the events of Acts two and Romans ten nine? You know, uh, what, 30 years maybe? So for 30 years, they didn't know that confession was needed for salvation. There's a missing step, you know? So yeah. they, they hop around not caring about time differences and distinctions and all of that. Dispensational distinctions. Now, can I find confession in the Old Testament? Absolutely, but it's not for salvation in the sense of what he's talking about, calling on the name of the Lord and all of that. So, yeah. It, it, it's just insane that they want to use those different passages that didn't exist at the time of Acts 238. Right. So what they're doing is they've imposed a systematic theology on the Bible. And then they want to say, oh, well, if you don't agree with our systematic theology, you don't agree with the Bible. Well, he just says that if, if, if he dismissed our view as theology and then he claimed to be a Bible. So, I mean, he wants it both ways. Yeah, Cram says he'll also read a half a verse. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what he does. Yeah, he does. It's theological yeah. cherry picking or patchwork is what it is. Yeah. Pick a verse here, pick a verse there, and try to make a big puzzle and make it a big hole and use these terms like synecdoche, which is not even a biblical term, by the way, uh, and then try to criticize us, but then turns right around guilty of the same thing. So that's a self-accepting fallacy. And he's violating the law of non-contradiction. He does make several uh, eisegetical statements, uh, contextual fallacies. I mean, all these, I mean, it's just so full of just uh, bunk, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I could say other words, but it wouldn't be very Christian. But anyway, you get the idea. Uh, it's just not, he's not biblical. He claims that he is such an authoritarian and he's so authoritative and he knows so much because he refers to his King James Bible. Well, you know, you could take God's word like Satan and twist it and make it say what you want it to say. And see, here's another issue is church of Christ. Whenever you do the world Bible school, they give you the, the new, the NIV. That is the translation they give you. It has a picture of a world on the front. It's not very big, but they have you do the NIV. So what you have is you, you if you're going to take the stand of King James onlyism in addition to Church of Christ, you're in conflict with your own organization. So my question is this, and I don't know if it's true. Does Church of Christ sanction the use of other translations? Would they go to the extreme of this? Would they endorse his King James onlyism, or would they think that 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 he's added something to Church of Christ? I'm not sure about that. From what I understand, they're the ones I've encountered are King James. Okay, I'm not sure. I can't speak to that 100. percent But either way, either way, Charles, they're still they're still teaching heresy. It's not if you're denying yeah. that the only condition for, for salvation is faith. You're denying that. Then you're denying the Bible. I mean, the Gospel of John is the only epistle written to a lost and dying world and telling people how to get saved by believing. And the word "believe" is mentioned like 98 to 99 times, which I'm sure you know that. But we got we got one whole book, not one one whole verse, one whole book plus more than one hundred verses mm-hmm. that support that faith is the only requirement to receive everlasting life. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's been used. This has been used before too. If you're, let's say, let's say, um, you know, like you and Travis were in a car wreck together. God forbid, mm-hmm. but let's just say hypothetically, if you were, and. You flip upside down. You, you're dying. You're, you're, you're getting ready to die. You're bleeding to death. And, you know, and you look at Travis and say, give me the gospel. Can you give me the gospel in two minutes? I'm dying. What do you think he'd say? Well, let me get you out of here and baptize you. Uh, you can't be baptized. You're dying. You have two minutes away. You get ready to lose your breath and die and go and slip into eternity. You're not going to be able to get out of the car and get baptized. Yeah. Or what, 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 what about this? What if you are on a submarine? You know, how are you going to get baptized? Well, yeah, yeah exactly. maybe they got maybe they got running water, <laughs> but I mean, the <laughs> point you is, sprinkle somebody. Yeah, uh, the, here's a bottle of water. Pour some water on them or something. Yeah, so I mean, now, this it, is the blood of Jesus right here. Yeah, it's got water. See. Yeah, 
Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I hope they, I hope they don't go to the extreme of holy water. You know. Well, I mean, if you're say, if they teach, and I know this, that you meet the blood. They'll tell. I even had a Church of Christ lady argue this with me. We were, we were used to be. Notice, I said used to. Keywords. Used to be friends with this Church of Christ lady, and she argued with me upside down, one the other. That you meet the blood through water baptism. I said, no, you do not. You cannot show me that in scripture. You're saying the water has some kind of saving power. Well, no. Well, that's exactly what you're saying. If you meet the blood through baptism. Yeah. It's heresy. It's a dead. Listen, if you're church of Christ, you are teaching heresy. You need to get saved the biblical way and accept the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that's just the way it is. Yeah. You, you can take that how you want. You can accept that or not accept it, but one day, if you're depending on you, find, you get to the well, great white throne judgment. You're going to find out your name was not in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're going to be cast into the lake of fire because you depended on water baptism, confession, and repentance to save you. Now yeah, that's it, just the it, way it is. is. It's sad, but you're going to be baptized with fire if you trust in water baptism alone. Yep, and, and it's, it's very tragic. It's very tragic, and I never did convince that lady, and she still believes that. And yet, here's another thing. If you notice this, Charles, the same uh, people, the same Church of Christ proponents, don't believe in eternal security, but yet they believe a person can lose their salvation, but they don't go back and rebaptize anybody. Right. Yeah. So it's like it's a one and done, but yet it's it, it, it's they're being inconsistent. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if if baptism is part of salvation and you lose your salvation, then why do you, why do you why don't you repeat the process? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cram says John was also known to the apostle of love. Yes, he was. And certainly these, the people that I've met, the Church of Christ people are anything but loving. Anything but loving. Okay, let's go on. Let's listen to your uh, explanation here. And uh, I think this is almost halfway through the six minutes I had prepared here in this clip. What, what must we do? This implies they already believe. Doing implies experiential obedience. The statement about repent is related to experiential repentance. It's a plural word that refers to the responsibility for the nation of Israel. And then be baptized is a shift to the singular, which means that it's a parenthetical phrase. And the statement about for the remission of sins is tied to repentance. So what that means is that repentance is tied to remission of sins and not necessarily baptism in that particular passage. So even though it's all experiential, there's nuances within that. And as for the ace arguments and all of that, that's not a problem either way. And far as about quoting the Badag, that was uh, that was uh, manipulated by Lutheran guy that edited it. And of course, Lutherans believe in baptismal regeneration. So, of course, they're going to put that into the text and we can go into that if we want. There is no confession unless you say that what must we do is a confession of amendment. But, you know, if that's your one text, the problem you run to is this. There was no Bible passages at that point. You can only use that one text. You can't use any of your other system because for the first 10 years, that's all the Israelites had right there. They had the apostles and the prophets and teaching and stuff. So if you're going to be consistent, then just use a little bit of Acts and don't pretend like you got all these other verses that support your argument and you read it all in. But really, you're just basing everything off of Acts 238, just like you try to make the accusation about we're basing everything off of John chapter 316. However, I've already established that that's based on the compositional aspect of the whole entire book of the Gospel of John, not just one sliver of the book of Acts. God bless. OK, appreciate it, Charles. Question you want was to comment you, any further on that. No, I mean, um, it's pretty, it's pretty well said, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've never fully, you know, the, every time I get put in a new debate situation, I have new articulations of things. I think about the implications of stuff and that doesn't mean everything that I say is right, but, uh, I'm being honest and thinking about the implications of what a person is saying there. And so that's what came out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you get the last word. Now listen right, to what he again, says right here. Uh, listen to this very carefully. Um, can you name one Bible passage? In, can you name one passage in the Bible that lists your plan of salvation? You know what, John? I would ask, can you give one Bible passage from Genesis or Charles 
in the review later on, but you guys won't answer this question. Give one Bible passage yes, from Genesis will. to Revelation where it says we're saved by faith only. Faith only. I'll tell you what, if you find one. Okay, yeah, well, let's see. Where do you want to start? Well, <laughs> finish his thought because I want to hear his question again. Where it says we're saved. Uh, I said, I'll write you a check if you can find one passage. Right, so in this debate, he asked me, can I show where someone got saved? Right. And, and and I said, I don't know. I said, here, let's just say no for now. And then later on, I replied, the Samaritan woman, I replied, you know, Mary and Martha, you know, they were already believers and things like that. But I would say the Samaritan woman, you know, may possibly Nicodemus, you know, there's people within the book of John that most people use to show that they came to salvation in the book of John. But he tries to make it sound like we can't prove that people are getting saved. And, you know, the intent of scripture is not to show how people get saved. <clears throat> if it mentions it, it's almost incidental, you know, but within the gospel of belief, there's a greater indication that or greater expectation that it would include how people got saved so that other people that are evangelizing can use those as examples in their own evangelism, you know. Mm hmm from Genesis to Revelation where it says we're saved by faith alone. And why I say that is a lot of you guys okay, well, make I hope these that arguments. Church of Christ is paying him really good and his bank account's full because uh, uh, I think I accept all major credit cards, you know, uh, debit cards. Uh, I'll take checks, personal checks. I'll give you my address, Travis, and you can go ahead and uh, go ahead and mail that to me if you want to. Or go, or better yet, go on my channel and make a donation. How about that? Because I got plenty of verses that I'm going to get ready to prove right here. And show you where it just where it mentions faith, even in the Old Testament. But you don't put your argument back on you. I think a good debater will learn to put the argument back on you. Since when it, do we ever not put our arguments back on us? You don't even uphold your own argument. It's a bad argument. All right. Argument. It's a bad oh, argument. Really? All right. He is full of bad arguments. That's all he did the whole debate was come up with bad arguments and logical fallacies and textual fallacies and condescension. And that's all he does. He doesn't come up with anything scholarly or biblical or theological. It's always insulting, tries to insult the other person because you don't agree with him and his heretical false teaching of the four steps of salvation. Okay, that was it. That was it. That was a clip right there. So any further comments? And I'm going to look at some scriptures here. No, no. Go ahead and go through the scriptures. Okay, let I'm, me just I'm pull good. these up. I got a Word document here. Um, can you see that good? I can see it, uh, uh, but that's all right. Uh, I'll tell you what. Minimize me and focus on the scriptures because that's more important than my ugly mother. No. Okay, let's see here. Let me get... Um, No. Okay, let me get uh let me do this. That's better. Okay, so I can still hear you when I'm talking. Now these are just basically there's a website, you know, that I do did the research from faithsafe.net, baptism regeneration. People in the old testament were saved without being baptized, Romans one, one through three, Galatians three, eight, Acts ten forty three. From the days of Adam to Noah to Abraham to Moses, through the rest of the old testament. Whoever believed in the coming Christ received remission of his sins. And Peter set this forth as a pattern for justification by faith in New Testament times. Good works were a result of an already received justification, not a prerequisite to forgiveness. And obviously no Old Testament believers were baptized. I'd like to see how they answer that. So they want to say baptism is a part of salvation, but they don't ever tell you how the people in the Old Testament were saved. Uh, Genesis 15, 6. A good scripture. Um, and since baptism is not found in the Old Testament, when Noah, uh, Genesis 6, 5, 8 through 9, Job 13 through 15, Jethro, Exodus 18, 1 through 12, Ruth, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, 1, 14 through 18, Manasseh, 2 Chronicles 33 through 30. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I get. Okay, yeah. Okay, so where did I get to? Manasseh, the people of Nineveh, Jonah 3, 5, and all other Old Testament saints were converted. They had their sins forgiven, 
and the righteousness in Christ imputed or reckoned to them the moment they believed apart from baptism. There you go, Travis. I mean, I could do this all day. It's so easy. All you got to do is read your Bible. That's all you have to do. The New Testament teaches justification by faith alone. And here's a whole slew of verses. I won't take time to pull all of them up. Uh, there's at least, I believe, more than probably 150, I believe, one scholar had said, somewhere around there, ballpark. Uh, John 1, 12 through 13, 14 through 18. And you can see there, I won't take time to read all that, but there's a, okay. People in the New Testament, they were saved by faith. Luke 7, 47, uh, the sinful woman. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, to whom little is, for, is forgiven, the same loves little. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Uh, the Lord said to the blind beggar Bartimaeus, thy faith has saved you. Luke 18, 42, 35 through 43, Mark 10, 46 through 52. I mean, do I need to go on and keep proving my point? I mean, it's obvious. Although he had not been baptized, he had come to faith in Christ, crying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Luke 18, 38. The Lord said to a Samaritan leper who believed in him, thy faith hath made thee whole. Luke 17, 9, 17, uh, 50, or chapter 17, verses 15 through 18. The woman with an issue of blood um, came to him spiritually in faith. John 6, 35, 37, daughter of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. Uh, and we could go, there's tons more uh, evidences here that I won't take time to read through every one of these. Uh, the rest of the New Testament also provides exam examples of men justified by faith before, before, did you catch that, Travis? If you're watching, before baptism. Timothy, his mother and his grandmother were all saved by faith. 2 Timothy 1, 5, 8 through 12, Acts 16, 1. Paul was saved by faith and called the priest the gospel before his baptism, Acts 26, 15 through 18. Okay, uh, now let's look. And here's some verses throughout John. John 1, 12, many has received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name, even to those that were dipped in water, went through a ceremony, were baptized by immersion, confessed, repented. It's not what it says. It doesn't say that. And of course, yes, John 3, 16, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, it's interesting. It's a lot like Mark. Uh, they will use Mark 16, where it talks about he that believeth is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. What is the, the basis of condemnation? Not believing in Christ is what condemns. That's why this verse here in John 3, 36 says, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He that believeth on the Son's got everlasting life. He that believeth not. So the reason for wrath, condemnation, and judgment is unbelief. That's what it says. In John 5, 24, you've got all three tenses here that refer to salvation. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, present tense, and shall not come into condemnation, uh, future tense, but is passed from death unto life, past tense. John 6, 40, everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Seeth is a figure of speech there to refer to, to receiving Christ, and I will raise him up the last day. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Acts 10, 43, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Um, and Acts 13, 39, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts 16, 30 and 31, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your house. What must I do? Get baptized, confess, repent, clean up my life, do some good works, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's plain and simple. How can you not see that? Oh, I tell you, my, my Travis, my checks or my bank accounts are really going to be piling up here. You better, better be getting your uh, money together. Uh, Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Romans 3.28, therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith. And see, it doesn't have to mention the word alone. He's going to argue, well, you're trying to say it's implied. No, I didn't even say that. It says by faith. What do you think by faith means? It didn't, And it also doesn't mention your little synecdoche 
Baptism, confession, and repentance by faith. Romans 4, 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I mean, it's just, it's on and on through the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. In Galatians 3.26, for you all are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And I'll go ahead and stop right there because, I mean, there's a ton more verses uh, that we could go over and that we could mention. But I'll bring Charles back up here. I can get back. All right, there you are, Charles. Okay. Now, what are your thoughts? I mean, I've just proven. I mean, there, and there's a slew more of scriptures I could that I could have mentioned, but I just debunked his whole argument. Show me one verse. I've just showed you several. Well, yeah, you definitely made the criteria one verse. You know, there's some of those verses that I might put in the experiential sanctification category, but um, there's other people in free grace that would definitely view them as positional salvation. So I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I'm sure that um, you met his requirement, and we'll see. We'll see how he responds. If he does respond, but. Um... But yeah, so that's that's kind of what I wanted to do. Now, uh, let's see. We got, I think, a couple of people. Um, Cram is still on here. Uh, let's see what he says here. Um, let's see. What does Cram say? Travis is sarcastic, but I suppose having to let him know he is a cult member is a little insulting feeling to him. Well, we're not trying to assault anybody. We're just dealing straight with the scripture. And if that's insulting, you know, it's not our fault. You know, conviction well, hurts. Usually what I do is whenever I meet somebody that claims to be part of an organization and thinks that they're right, I'll say, is there one area of belief that you disagree with that organization? So if it's a Catholic, like, is there one area that you disagree with the Catholic Church on? And if they tell me no, then I would say, okay, you're you're basically in a cultic, uh, in a cult. If they say yes, then I would say, well, then why are you Catholic? And the whole thing is this, is that how much leeway does Church of Christ actually allow? Because what I'm hearing is that Richard Lee says he's not Church of Christ, but yet holds the Church of Christ doctrine. Travis Thomas says he's Church of Christ and thinks he's the spokesperson for Church of Christ. And then you got A.K. Richardson, who uh, believes things differently than Church of Christ in some areas, which is ambiguous because I don't know what those details are yet. And so it's like, how much leeway does Church of Christ allow in differences in interpretation on these issues? Because somebody's not really Church of Christ. And if someone's not really Church of Christ, they're not in the good graces of Church of Christ. And if they're not in the good graces of Church of Christ, that means according to their view, they're no longer in Christ. And if they're no longer in Christ, then that means the blood of Christ is not applied to them and they're going to hell, according to their, unless they, and then therefore they got to go get saved again and get in the good graces of Church of Christ. So one of those three, cannot all be in the good graces of the Church of Christ mm -hmm. right now. One of them is a false representative of the Church of Christ, you know, and uh, they're going to get exposed, you know, but probably by the Church of Christ. There may become, there may come Church of Christ people that come after them because they're misrepresenting Church of Christ. Yeah, that's possible. I know AK, AK did say to me, because I asked him, I said, you're, you're Church of Christ? He said, well, no, I... I have a, how did he word it? Something about he has a background of Church of Christ. Well, it's the same thing. And then he says, well, those verses that the Church of Christ interpret about water baptism being a part of salvation or whatever, he said he didn't agree with that. Those verses talking about water. So does he, does he agree with my view then that it's experiential baptism? He doesn't say. He never said. And I wanted to debate the topic with him on baptism, but he wouldn't do it. He refused to do it. I don't know maybe, why. Maybe but. maybe he has Church of Christ followers and he don't want to, you know, bring bring he, up his beliefs and therefore lose his audience in that sense. He's done it before and he debated, debated with Matt Slick. And of course, Max Slick's a Calvinist. Yeah, he's a Presbyterian. So he believes in, you know, uh, sprinkling and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And he tries to argue Jesus was sprinkled. And I don't think there's evidence for that. But anyway, he did actually. He, he argued Jesus sprinkled. Jesus' baptism is not believer's baptism, you know. Yeah. 
Right. But as a Calvinist, he still defeated AK. And also, Matt Slick debated Travis Thomas, and he, he used – it's a typical argument, but it worked. He used the thief on the cross, and he kept asking him and hammering and hammering and hammering, uh, how, was the thief on the cross saved, yes or no? And Travis wouldn't answer. He wouldn't answer. And right. finally, Matt said, answer the question. Was the thief on the cross saved or not? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go. And he, he had to admit it and admit defeat. So because if baptism saves – Mm-hmm. And some people say, well, you don't know that he wouldn't take him down off the cross and, and baptize. Well, He's tell dead. me in church history that He's anybody dead. was taken off the cross to be baptized and put back on the cross. Well, that would be baptism for the dead because he would be dead. They, well, yeah. they, they, they made sure they were dead. He wasn't sure. taken off the cross until he was dead. Just same thing with Jesus. Jesus but they wouldn't take him down when he was still alive. Oh, let's dip him some water and put right, him Right, yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, come on. You put up there to die. Now, what, now, what some people have tried to argue is that, well, the reason the thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized because he didn't live long enough, you know. But okay, well, well, if that's one exception, where's the rest of exceptions? And then if you, and then if you start having all these exceptions for water baptism, why don't you question whether water baptism is actually necessary for salvation? You know. Yeah. Yeah. If you need all these exceptions, then I think you should consider whether, uh, whether you're your thesis is correct, you know. Right, so. exactly. All right, Charles, any concluding statements about this debate and what we've talked about? No. Um, I think that the people that are watching your channel, they're going to be free grace. And I just suggest that if they are free grace, that they connect with us somehow on social media, that they fellowship with us and get to know us better. Um. I'm not into apologetics, even though I'm doing debates and stuff. I'm just trying to do, uh, clear up issues concerning salvation and sanctification and testing my own theories for finding stuff and papers and all of that. But the reality is, is that uh, it's needed. We need to be dealing with these issues, you know. And so I appreciate your channel. Like it says, it's a point of defense. You know, we can't just be on the offense. Uh, we have to be on the defense sometimes in our life. And the best defense, I think, is, as as First Peter, I think it is 3.15, says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. And so as we just fill our, our, our uh, mind with Scripture and establish our hearts with grace, then we're ready, you know. And so I, I appreciate you fighting with me in this battle, and I just pray that more people come to the free grace position. Yeah, and we're making quite... I think uh, quite uh, mm -hmm. so some differences on doing these videos and also with the free grace app, there's a free grace app that people can get on and check. I'll have that in the link if you want to be a part of that. And it lists a lot of YouTube channels, debates, links to websites like Dr. Charlie Bing's um, gracelife.org and also other websites like faithalone.org. Um and uh, Sean Lazar used to be a part of that, but he's also he's with uh, I think Lucas Kitchen now doing Grace International. So there's that uh, sect as well. That's a new sect that they started, Grace International. I don't know. We should call it a sect, but yeah, <laughs> or, or uh, maybe another division. Uh, 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 yeah, a sect, uh, but another division or a derivative of Free Grace. Yeah. But it's interesting too that there are any there's any number of quite a number of different beliefs within the Free Grace camp on different issues. Yeah, but we so, all come together on what it takes to be saved, and that's simple trust in Jesus Christ alone. So we, we can all agree on that. Yeah, so I describe it as the free grace camp, and then you have the different tribes <laughs> within it, and then you have the different tents within it, you know. Right. So. All right. Uh, any, I think Cram is still on there. Cram is, we appreciate you, Cram, coming on here. Oh, yeah, he gets wired up when dealing with Church of Christ. Uh, uh, um, does, it, does Cram, you got, do you have any questions you want to ask? Uh, if there's anybody else in the chat uh, that wants to ask anything, I, I don't know if Elizabeth L is still with us. Um, and anybody else that wants to ask us some questions or make any comments before we go off the air tonight. I don't see anybody asking anything or saying anything else. So um, let's see. Graham says something about the fundamentals of the faith. 
I don't know what he what he mean what he means by that, but I don't know if he's saying justification is one of the fundamentals of the faith, and it is. And of course, the deity of Christ, the authority of Scripture, His second coming, His virgin birth, all those are part of the fundamentals or essentials of the Christian faith. Um, let's see. He asked, "Have you or Charles exegeted First John?" Yeah, 16, 16, 18. I don't know why that didn't show up. First John 16, 18. There's no such thing. What is he talking about? Oh, he says here, 3, 5. First John 3, 5. About born of God is not sin. Is that what he's talking about? I guess so, yeah. Let's see. You know that he appeared to, uh, in order to take away sins, and in him there's no sin. Is that the one you're talking about, Cram? Cram, you're all over the place. We'll just talk to you in Discord. We're not understanding what you're saying. I don't know what he means. What he means there, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll get back to that, and when we do another show or something. But um, well, well, thank you for coming on, Cram. I appreciate it, no. Charles. Thank you for coming on. Um, I think you did an excellent job on the debate. Um, so props to you. Uh, I think you stood on the word. You didn't stand on your opinion and, uh, you used the chart. I think and anybody wants to watch it, I'm going to have the full debate in the description link. As soon as we go off and we'll post all that and all the credits and all that, like I always do. So if you're interested in checking out the full debate, it's really a great debate. You can go and watch all this and just see for yourself what was said. And, um, That'll make a difference in, in how you interpret. I think if you weigh out both arguments, you see which arguments you think as a viewer are the most plausible, or the most exegetical, the most biblical, the most the theological, et cetera, et cetera. So, all right. So with that said, any last words, Charles? Well, if you don't, we'll go ahead and. No, uh, I'm not a sports. I don't watch sports, but I think the Super Bowl was today and, and uh, or is today. And I'm just amazed that you wanted to do a stream on Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, so, I'm, not, I'm not a sports person either. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> that that's a good that's good. You know, yeah. so this to right. me, is, I'd, I'd rather be doing this. This is most important, I think, since we're dealing with eternal eternal matters. Amen. Not knocking sports, but uh, you know, it's just not my thing. But well, I appreciate your fellowship and and uh, for what you do for ministry and stuff and. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I think we're in a good cause, and I hope other people will see that and, and examine Scripture for themselves and, and, and discover God's free grace. Yes, amen. All right, thank you very much, Charles. I'll have you back again. We'll do another show, and I'm sure I'll be back with you on your show, mm -hmm. your after shows. Uh, we can probably we can probably be doing some more uh, debate discussions as well, and also on Discord as well on the uh, free grace uh, app as well and uh, the free grace server so i was trying to say free grace server and all that so and i'll have all that in the links for you so if, uh, that's going to conclude our broadcast for uh, tonight thank you for watching and please if you have not yet subscribed go to my channel subscribe like and share pray for this ministry we really need it i'm just trying to build it up as quickly as i can and also if you have uh, if you feel led to make a donation to my ministry or to charles uh, ministry, the Layman Seminary, please do that as well. I'll have the links and emails in there for you to do that. So uh, he has a, an excellent channel of Bible teaching where he explains the Bible uh, with the Greek languages and uh, things of that nature. So it's just very theological, very scholarly. So thank you, Charles, for coming on and thank you for watching tonight. And I will see you on the next video. Hang around, Charles, before you go. <laughs>